All right. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to SaberSim's DFS Office Hours. It is Monday, March 14th of 2022. I hope you all had a good weekend here uh, and enjoying daylight savings time here. Uh, the, The spring forward, looking forward to having a little bit of extra daylight here this evening. Uh, as we get started on today's stream, a uh, couple announcements, a couple congratulations, I think, are in order. Uh, first off, uh, huge congratulations to SaberSim Will for taking down the big MMA contest on DraftKings for a cool 100 grand over the weekend. We just put out our brand new MMA Sims uh, this past week, I believe on Friday, right before the card this weekend. Will had an enormous hand in putting together those simulations and getting that out to everybody. And then, of course, proceeded to take the whole thing down on Saturday, uh, which is just awesome to see. We're going to be having Will on later this week on an episode of Office Hours uh, to actually talk about what goes into the MMA Sims uh, and, you know, everything, everything going on there. So look forward to that. That will be going on later this week. Going to be very interested to talk to him uh, after this big win this weekend. And also a big congratulations to SaberSim Eric, who took down uh, the big NASCAR contest on FanDuel and also play second in the contest on Giraffe Kings. Uh, we just put out our NASCAR Sims a couple weeks ago here. It's awesome to see that those are crushing as well. And we have a couple videos already on our YouTube channel about how to use Saber Sim to crush NASCAR, uh, along with how the simulations are put together uh, and a couple other videos here. So uh, if you aren't playing some of these other sports here, uh, if you haven't tried NASCAR DFS before, if you haven't tried MMA DFS before, uh, now is a great time to start. These simulations give you an enormous edge when you're building lineups for these higher variance sports. Um, highly recommend checking out some of the content that's already up on the YouTube channel for the NASCAR Sims, uh, tuning into the MMA streams that we're planning on doing later this week, uh, and checking these sports out. It makes for a fun weekend sweat. Uh, obviously, we've got NBA going on, hockey's going on, uh, esports, um, but baseball, waiting for baseball to start up here in a couple weeks. Just a really great opportunity to check out some of these other sports uh, where you can get a, a huge edge. I think the field uh, trying to stumble through using average projections and traditional optimizers uh, really just makes these MMA and NASCAR contests really soft at times. Um, and I think there's just a, a, an enormous edge to be gained there. So tune into those uh, those videos, those streams, and another big congratulations to Will and Eric for their success this weekend. Uh, it was quite a sweep on the, the SaberSim team here this weekend. So um, really excited to see that. We'll go ahead. We'll start diving in here and uh, tackling some questions. I just realized uh, I didn't have my screen pulled up when I was doing that. So I, I was trying to show the, the NASCAR videos on YouTube here. So there they are. Uh, I think it's like the second or third playlist us down. If you go to our YouTube channel, you can see them right there. The MMA stuff, again, we'll we'll do some streams this week. We'll get those videos out. Uh, we've got a handful of questions already in our queue here for today. Uh, looks like quite a bit of variety, so a lot of fun, different stuff to talk about here. Uh, as always, if you've got questions for me, go ahead and pop them into the Office Hours channel in Slack uh, or YouTube chat. Either is fine, and we'll get to questions in about the order they came in. Uh, I'm going to start here, actually. We had a question come in into our support inbox over the weekend that I think is a good place to start. And the question was mostly about um, beating small field GPPs. So let me type that into chat, get that pulled up on screen so people know what we're talking about here. And let's talk about this. Yeah, so we had a, we had a question come in from our inbox. I, I think it basically just said, you know, how do I, how do I beat smaller field GPPs? Um, and I think the simple answer to that, or at least where I want to start here, is that uh, our sliders, our build settings, are optimized for different contests. So uh, the way we've done this is we've actually gone through and built thousands of lineups at every single combination of different slider settings and compared them to past historical contests that have run. Uh, and we've set these sliders at what we think is optimal based on where our backtesting has generated the highest expected value lineups for the contest you're playing. So if you're playing smaller field single entries, let's say, you know, let's pick something, uh, you know, maybe 500 man contests, right? We'll set the sliders and adjust things to where we think it makes sense for that particular contest. So you'll get, uh, if we do this build, for example, right? A GPP, single entry, uh, 500 or so entrance, right? And we'll build 10 lineups. We'll do a nice big pool of 500 and just see what this kind of looks like. We're gonna get a pool of 500 different lineups all of which we believe are optimal for this particular 
contest size. Uh, I think it makes overall adjusting your strategy in terms of how you're dealing with ownership and variance and things like that on a per contest, on a contest size basis, uh, a lot easier than it is uh, with other tools out there. Um, so that's where I'd start. From there, um, I, I think in terms of when you're thinking about kind of general strategy for these smaller field tournaments, uh, I think what you will find is that you can get an ownership edge uh, a lot more easily in these contests. There's a lot of people uh, that are going to be throwing cash lineups into these contests uh, or playing contests that are overall just a little bit too safe. There's this uh, kind of phenomenon here of ownership condensing significantly onto the overall best average projected plays in these smaller field tournaments. Uh, that's actually part of the reason why that you'll see the ownership fade slider comes down to zero or to a very low value for these smaller fields, because you're often getting enough ownership leverage. You're getting enough relative edge on the field from an ownership standpoint, purely by having a little bit of variance built into your builds based on the fact that, you know, you're using the Saberson projection model, uh, and not just building an optimal, you're allowing a little bit of natural variance in there, considering uh, the range of outcomes of each, each player in these lineup construction, that these lineups will naturally fade enough ownership on their own to, to be viable for these particular contests. Uh, another way of thinking about the ownership leverage that you get in smaller fields here, you can see we're getting some low owned plays, right? Uh, another way you can think about these ownership leverages in a smaller field is if, if you've got a 1,000 man contest and you're playing a 10% owned player, right? Uh, there are only 900, there are only 99 other lineups in that contest that you are competing with that may also have that player on average if that ownership projection is correct. If you compare that to a 10,000 person contest, there's 999 other lineups in that contest that may have that particular player you get an ownership edge much more quickly by playing lower owned players in these smaller fields. You can get a unique lineup. You can differentiate in the other roster positions more quickly. So uh, I guess all of this is to say that I think uh, using the default sliders for these smaller fields is a great place to start. And then having a very kind of selective ownership edge can be a great way to add a little bit of additional value. I think in my particular, for NBA in particular, my favorite way to approach this is I like to look at what are going to be the chalkiest pay-up options on the slate. A lot of times you'll see that these elite values, the chalkiest players on, a, on an NBA slate are going to be pretty elite value plays. I mean, right now, looks like most of the value is coming from the Clippers. So we've got Coffey, Luke Kennard. These guys are going to be projected so well at their average. Their range of outcomes is so generous to lineup construction that you'll see that the builder typically tosses these guys into 100% of your lineups uh, or the vast majority of these small field single entry lineups. But when we get to guys like even LaMelo Ball is a good example, you'll see that there are typically some chalkier, more expensive options that are just slightly better projected than average compared to the other players at their, their positions, or there's a certain roster construction that is leading people to playing these guys more and more. One of my favorite things to do to add a little bit of value to my, when I'm playing a smaller field, if I'm kind of going single bullet into a, maybe a higher stakes, small field, single entry kind of contest is to take a stand on one of the more aggressive pay up options. And right now it looks like it might be ball. I actually, you know, I prefer to do this a little bit more when there's a more expensive pay up option that's getting chalky. Maybe that's, Eh, it doesn't really look like we have that right now. But let's say, you know, just because of the way that the lineup construction worked out and maybe Giannis is slightly projected a little bit more than the field, uh, the amount of players that are going to roster Giannis in a smaller field GPP is going to be much higher than his ownership projection would indicate for a larger field GPP. And one of my favorite things to do, uh, let's go back to ball actually here, is to just X those guys out and just kind of see if there's a way to differentiate a little bit amongst the rest of the lineup and get a little bit of an additional edge. Purely fading the one chalky payup option in a smaller field tournament is a lot of times plenty of leverage to get a profitable lineup in play. Um, so again, small field GPP strategy. Uh, my, my favorite things to do here, first of all, is to use the default sliders that have been optimized for that particular contest. But then second of all, to differentiate, especially in NBA, just a little bit on the chalkier, more expensive players 
who have a very similar upside to other players in their salary range and their projection range, but whose ownership typically gets way out of control in these large, in these, sorry, these smaller field tournaments compared to what they might be in a, in a larger field. Uh, again, with the, with the ball example and projections will change a lot throughout the day today. So this is just an example, but if he is truly going to be, uh, you know, the third chalkiest player on the slate, 23% or so in larger field GPPs, the kind of consensus, you know, maybe more pay up option. I think Trey Young's in play there too, is that maybe being that kind of guy. If the field believes that that is the consensus best pay up option on the slate, that ownership will be much, much higher in a small field tournament. And you can get a ton of leverage on the field by just fading that player and using somebody who probably has a very similar overall projection. So uh, those are, those are my favorite strategies for attack in small field. Um, I can't remember exactly who sent this question in. We'll get you a timestamp recording to this part of the stream. And as always, if you have any other questions for me as a follow-up, uh, just email us back and, and we'll happy, I'm happy to keep talking about this. So, um, But until then, let's keep it going here. I'm going to jump into some of these other questions uh, that came in over the weekend in the Office Hours channel. And let's see here. Um, good question from Tiger Knoll here about uh, setting exposures here. Um, kind of a long question. I'm gonna, I'll read most of this out here. Um, if I set a few player exposures to have a min X percent and run my GPP builds, and then if I don't reset the exposure settings and run a cash build, do those minimums also carry over to the cash build? I think I caught that happen to me tonight. If so, is there a way to preserve those exposure settings in step one? Because I still want them to be in effect for GPP late swap, but erase them for my cash build because I don't want to force any players into my cash lineups. Um, there's a little bit more here. I, I get the gist of the question. The, the answer actually at the moment is there's not a very easy way to do that. We know that's a little bit of a hole here. Um, and that's something that's a, that we plan on fixing in a future update. Uh, I think the goal here would be to give you the ability to set exposure settings and maybe save those exposure settings somewhere uh, so that you could clear exposures and then reload as needed. Um, there is unfortunately not a very good way to do that. I do think um, Tiger Knoll here, what you have described as, as a workaround here of just running the cash build first uh, with no exposure settings, then setting your exposures in step one um, and uh Going from there, I think is a fine approach. Uh, the one other option here too is that exposures that are set within a given build are local to that build. So if we went in here and said, for example, just on this build, 50% uh, Amir Coffee, just as a as a hypothetical here, um, this 50% would not be passed backwards into step one. Uh, so another option here is lean a little bit more on your exposures that are set in step three on a build to build basis, rather than setting the global exposures on step one uh, may help get you by in the meantime. But I know that's not the most satisfying answer for right now. Uh, this is something that we want to, to improve in the future, make a little bit easier for you guys. So, but good question there. Um, and then a good question here from Tone930 as well. Let's get this one pulled up on screen. I see our uh, viewer count here is is uh, jumping up pretty quickly here. So welcome, everybody. Happy Monday. Um, uh, let's see if we get... Okay, so Tone said, MLB question in regards to late swap. What do you recommend if a lineup for the later game changes after lock in a minor way? Let's say the team changes their nine-hole hitter, for example, from what was expected to somebody else but doesn't change the order of the lineup would you just use the late swap or the quick swap since the stack theoretically almost has the exact same correlation being that the position in the order has not changed and only one player has uh there's a couple different options here that that you can go with um in this exact example where you just have a one-to-one -one swap of a player in the exact same position in the order i think the easiest thing to do as you mentioned here is to just see if the salaries work out um, and I would just do a direct quick swap in that case, one player to the other. Um, you can do that using the entry editor quick swap here. Um, let me go ahead and get some entries pulled in so that we can maybe at least do a quick demo here for, for those of you that don't really know um, about quick swap. Let's see. Well, let me pull this up with reserved entries. Yeah. So you can do an exact specific player one-to-one -one swap here, um, provided that the salaries work out or get pretty close. Um, and I think that that's a very easy way to, to do this here, to, to resolve this particular thing here. You can even do it on the sites. 
Um, sometimes if it's a very simple swap, the example I always use is Will Smith and Austin Barnes. I think for the Dodgers, just because they play on the West Coast so often, uh, a lot of times that lineup comes out late. Um, and it's generally very easy to swap from Will Smith to Austin Barnes, for example, if that's the situation. I'm not even sure if both of those guys are still on the Dodgers right now. Some of the, they might be, they might be free agents. Uh, but that's always a, a very easy swap to make. Um, generally swapping down in salary into just do a one to one swap. The projections are so similar. Also, the average projections for those guys are so similar that you can typically do that without consequence. You're mostly playing the correlation game there, keeping those guys uh, in the the same lineup together. Um, a couple other options here, though. I think there are some some more. I don't, and not even necessarily creative options, but let's say you get a, a totally different lineup than expected, right? Uh, or you you built lineups and your Dodger stacks uh, were, were built the way they were, and then three or four of the guys that we were expecting to be in the lineup aren't, and you've got other guys coming in. Uh, what do you do then? We actually added a really cool feature for this year. Uh, that I think is is pretty slick. I think it's going to be really useful for baseball. I think it's probably already useful for hockey, for those of you guys that are playing hockey DFS out there. Uh, and it's the ability to only late swap lineups that have a player that's out. Uh, it shows up as this little toggle down here. If you turn this on, we will see which lineups have players that are either marked as out or projected for zero and swap only those lineups that have those players in them. Um, you would never, you would virtually never want to do this for NBA because a player getting ruled out in NBA creates so much additional value on the rest of the team that typically you want to be swapping all of your lineups uh, so that you can take advantage of that new value that's opened up. But in a sport like baseball where, you know, especially if you spent the time to dial in your exposures on stacks and you've gotten a set of lineups that's really fine-tuned, you don't necessarily want to blow everything up and swap everything. You just want to fix those Dodgers or Angels or Giant stacks, all these West Coast teams that typically uh, end up having their lineups come out pretty late. You can now turn this toggle on. Um, I actually, you know, there's a part of me that's thinking this may be just the overall best practice when this situation comes up at all now. Um, I still like the quick swap idea, especially if it's a very simple one-to-one -one change uh, if the, the the lineup comes out a little bit different than we've expected. But if you've got these situations where the, the order of the lineup has shifted, the correlations of the players batting in the lineup are going to be a little bit different. Uh, if there's a lot of different players in the lineup than what we expected, I think this is going to be super useful this season for doing that. So uh, that is is probably the, the best practice for, for baseball situations. So looking forward to using that this season. I know um, it's a simple little toggle, pretty simple little change, but definitely something that was commonly requested. Pretty excited about having that out. So good question. I see YouTube chats heating up as well. We will get to all the questions today here. I promise I'm going to keep knocking out uh, some um, of the questions that are in, in first. Uh, we have a question here from Clement. Um, real quick, I just saw this from Fossey4. Uh, does that only work for list out or include zero projection too? It includes zero projection too. So I believe that is actually like explicitly the logic here. Is it is any player that has a projection of zero um, or is marked out in the app? Similar, it's actually the exact same logic as quick swap. So quick swap will work the same way, right? You know, there's situations sometimes like, uh, you know, maybe a player gets marked as doubtful or something right before a game starts. So their projection goes to zero, but they aren't literally out on the injury report. We will pick those situations up when quick swapping and get those guys out of your lineups. Uh, it's the same way on on um, the, the late swap toggle as well. So. Um, anyway, let's get to this question here from Clement. Let's see, did I grab this one? Yeah. So uh, he said, what's the best process for single games and NBA? So let's jump over here. So first of all, I popped this link into uh, the replies on Slack to this question here. Um, we have a whole video, an hour-long video that I recorded at the start of this season on our YouTube channel. It's a part of the NBA course. You don't have to be a pro to beat NBA showdowns. This is an hour long talking about NBA showdown strategy in a ton of detail. I would say if you're interested in playing NBA showdowns, I'd go check that video out. I will kind of briefly summarize a lot of what I talk about in this video here and talk about overall some NBA showdown strategy. Uh, first off, I have really become a fan of these contests this year. 
Uh, they don't, apart from the last showdown of the of the slate, so the Knights showdown, the very last game on the slate, typically has some really nice contests. Uh, I always I definitely recommend playing that one, but I've really become attached to this season in particular playing all of the showdowns, at least uh, when I have the availability to do so, I think it can be a really good way to smooth out your variance on a given slate and kind of silo games. You almost get the opportunity when you're really right on a game to capture some of that equity out of slate. Like, for example, you know, let's look at the showdowns tonight. So we've got, uh, let's say, you know, just hypothetically, the, the Minnesota and San Antonio uh, game here. Let's say that that whether you're using the default projections or the, the the default sims, or you're making some of your own adjustments. Let's say that you were just very on about the way that you uh, projected this game or, or forecasted this game. Uh, with nine other or eight other games on the slate, a nine game slate total, that might not be enough to to win back equity, right? That's just one game on the slate. You have to be right about a lot else. Uh, and there's there's plenty of things that can go wrong. If you're very, very wrong on a game that you have a ton of exposure to, that might sink your entire main slate. By playing this showdown, you have the opportunity to win back some of that equity there and, and capitalize on the fact that maybe you had forecasted or projected or, or you know, played strategically one game correctly. Uh, it also just smooths your variance out. It just gives gives you more lineups in play, gives you more opportunity to realize some of your equity more quickly. So I've been really enjoying playing these. Uh, in terms of overall strategy, there's a couple things. Let's actually jump to the Toronto and Lakers game because that's the one that will have the, the bigger contests. Uh, first off, a lot of the strategy of beating showdowns, not just for NBA, but for other sports as well, is already captured for you because you're using simulations to build your lineups. If you come in here, right, and set, you know, a typical contest, right, so maybe the something like this. When we're using Sim Variance 10, what that means is every single lineup is going to be, be using a single game simulation and then building the optimal lineup from that individual game sim. That is an enormous part of the strategy required to beat showdowns in general, coming up with what are the possible game scripts and then what are the optimal lineups that are represented by those game scripts? If you were using a traditional optimizer and average projections, that would basically be the entirety of your showdown process, which just goes to show you how much Saberson is doing for you here, right? We're going to go in, we're going to pull a single game simulation out. We're going to build the optimal for that single game simulation. Then we're going to do that 500 times or 1500 times if you want and figure out then what the best 20 lineups from that set are. So I... First of all, in terms of like overall showdown strategy, I, a ton of the value here is just captured purely from using simulations and a sim variance 10. From there, I think some of the best time spent in your overall showdown strategy is thinking about how you are going to avoid duplication. I've talked a lot on this stream about why duplication is, is dangerous in DFS. Um, there is a video, I'll call this one out as well, calling a lot of videos out on the YouTube channel today, but that's great. We've got a lot of content on here. Uh, all the way at the bottom in our Office Hours Greatest Hits, there's this eight-minute video, why is avoiding duplication important in DFS? Um, very quick kind of spreadsheet calculator that shows how your expected value for a lineup literally drops the moment it is duplicated. So I checked that out. Uh, but... That's probably one of the biggest value adds you can do here when you're building lineups with Saber Sim uh, for showdowns. What I typically like to do is there's a few different things I'll do to avoid duplication. The first is I'll adjust my maximum salary down. You'll see by default, it's already not at 50K for DraftKings. It's down at 49.9, uh, which you know helps that a little bit here. A lot of times I'll take that down a little bit more, maybe even to like 495 and then the other thing I'll do is I'll try to figure out what is the field going to do? How is the how do I expect the field to think about this game? Uh, a couple things I'll look at. I'll look at how we project the game in terms of the spread and total. I'll also look at how Vegas is projecting the game and get a sense of, is the field going to think that this game is going to be close or is the field going to think that this game is going to be a blowout in one direction or the other, right? And I'll also go ahead, once we build some lineups here, I'll try to get a sense of of what the popular constructions are going to be, and in particular, what the what the popular captains are going to be. Uh, I have found over and over again that the field in both NBA and also NFL Showdown uh, overvalues the highest projected plays in the captain spot. Uh, that they undervalue the percent 
chance or the overall probability of of not one of the elite plays uh, or not one of the highest overall projected plays being the optimal captain. And I think you can get a ton of leverage uh, looking into this and especially a name like LeBron James or especially a guy that has been going off as often as LeBron has been. You can reduce your chance of being duplicated in these particular contests significantly just by unchecking that name. And what's nice about this, as I mentioned before here, is that you know that the the remaining 20 lineups you're left with after excluding LeBron from the captain spot are still optimals from single game simulations. You are just selecting a different 20 from that set of your 500 sims. I think you can also get uh, some uh, additional value of creating a unique lineup by looking at what the, the stack constructions are. Um, I think the field in general overvalues balance builds. So uh, three threes and even four twos, I think, can be a little bit overused at times. Um, but another way of thinking about this is flipping the game script on its head, right? If the field is going to build average projections and assume that uh, a game with a 10-point spread is always going to be a blowout or always going to be a 10-point game in favor of the favorite, reverse that. And build some lineups that are overweight towards the the underdog, or or maybe are a little bit more balanced. Or in the case where you do have a very tight spread, maybe you have a a one point spread or a pick 'em game, right? Only only play your your five stacks, right? And again, I'll, I'll make this kind of point one more time. The 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 safety net here is that you know even let's say we wanted to do something crazy and we wanted to only play five stacks. We're gonna play only five stacks, and we're only gonna play. We're not gonna play any LeBron captain you are still left with a pool of 20 lineups that are optimal for certain game simulations, right? That That is the core point that is made here. You are ultimately just selecting for certain game sims over another based on what you think are the most likely to be unique. Um, something like this probably has a very high chance to be unique, even a larger field tournament, right? Leaves 1,700 salary on the table. LeBron's in the lineup, but not at the captain. And in this case, it's a five Raptors stack, which maybe will be a little bit more popular if the field thinks that the Raptors are likely to win this game. But I, the Lakers are always popular. I, I think that's probably still a little unlikely. So that's my quick summary. Again, I guess it wasn't so quick. Um, I've captured this in a lot more detail and... Um, uh, I, 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 a lot more, I don't know, nuance, I guess here in this hour long video. So if you're interested in this a little bit more, I'd go check that video out, but I highly recommend checking out these, these NBA showdowns. Uh, I think just, just the fact alone that you will be taking simulations with you here into these contests, uh, puts you in a position to succeed and, and it can really spread out your variance on these slates where there's nine games, right? So, all right. Get a sip of water here. We'll keep it going. All right, cool. Um, a couple more questions, a few more questions here in Slack, and then we'll hop over to YouTube chat. This is from Matt. He said, when building for contests, how do I build them all as unique builds? Uh, a couple different ways I think this can be taken. I think the, the first way I kind of read this here is, how do I make sure I have a unique lineup into every entry that I'm playing? Uh, that is, in fact, at least for people just starting out with SaberSim or just starting out with DFS, that's what we generally recommend you do with your particular uh, with your with your contest selection and entry mix. Um, sorry, my my dog's kind of freaking out of the door all of a sudden. Uh, I'll show you kind of quickly how we do that. So, first of all, you'll get your entry editor opened up, get your entries file in here and get a sense of what your, uh, see, I can see my dog running around behind me here. How many, how many entries you have in the slate tonight? So in this case, I have 46 entries into tonight's main slate, right? So then what you'll want to do here, and you can see I'm, I'm also in the uh, community game here that um, Brad put together. Anyway, what you'll want to do is you'll want to build a unique lineup all in one build here for this particular slate, right? As long as you build all of your lineups together in one build, they will all be unique from one another. So you go in here, play 46 lineups. I'm going to just set my sliders at something that I think is kind of close and appropriate to all of these different contests. I've got a mix of single entries and 20 maxes. Maybe I will pick, whoops, sorry. Maybe I will pick something like the 20 max, 1,000 to 10,000 to kind of get a set of lineups that are pretty close. And when we build this set of 46 lineups, they will all be a unique lineup. So we'll build this real quick. We'll get my set of 46 here. 
and uh, then we'll use a unique fill in the entry editor to make sure we get a unique lineup into every single contest. All right, so I've got 46 unique lineups. We'll jump back over to the entry editor here. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to pick one of the unique fill methods. So there's two different options here. Uh, the, the simpler one, I think, at least to explain is unique random, which is basically just going to take a random lineup. Where Every entry is going to be filled with a random lineup from our 46 lineup build or our 46 lineup pool. So everything's filled. There's a unique lineup in everything. Uh, the other option here is to use the unique rank, which instead is going to fill a unique lineup into every single contest, but it's going to do it in order of Sabre score in the order of the contest as they are listed here. So one thing I could hypothetically do is I could sort by buy-in, for example, and then fill with the unique rank method. And then what that's going to do is my highest overall Sabre score lineup will go into this contest, then the second one here, the third one here, fourth, fifth, then the sixth through the 26th will all go in here. The 27th would go here and so on until they're all filled like that. Um, also gives you a unique lineup into every single contest. In this case, you just have a little bit more control over what lineup goes into what contests. So that is how you would literally uh, go ahead and make sure that you have a unique lineup into every entry. I think the other way that I was reading this is basically how do I get a unique lineup in my contests? Um, that's definitely a, a lot more of a strategy question. There's going to be some some sports specific nuance there also some contest specific nuance um i just mentioned you know for nba showdowns how i would go about avoiding duplication in those kinds of builds um that is different in classic slates that's also different on the the individual sport that you're playing i would say for nba in particular for classic slates with a typical number of games nine games um that's probably not something that's really a big concern uh, the likelihood of being duplicated in a typical, you know, something like the and one on a nine game NBA slate with eight different roster positions and however many players in the pool is generally pretty low uh, in other sports like well or other contest types like showdowns um, or esports uh, or MMA or, or even golf to some extent. Uh, the individual need to to play a unique lineup um, come or I would say the extent to which you need to think about getting a unique lineup uh, increases. Um, I would say this, Matt, if you are more specifically talking about how do you get a unique lineup in the individual contest you are playing, let me know what sport you are talking about um, there. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail um, because I, I think my strategies of how I choose to do that vary a little bit on a sport to sport basis. So, but I, I think this is mostly how do I get a unique lineup into all of my entries? And, and that's, we've covered that here. So, um, cool. All right, let's keep it going here. Um, and then a good question from Mark here uh, about effective entrance. Oh, let's see. All right, cool. Um, he said, I understand the concept and strategy of picking low stakes, small dollar GPPs with more than a thousand effective entrants playing under $3 avoids the big sharks. Uh, but please address why you believe playing more entrants versus less is beneficial. Um, less skilled players enter larger field contests, higher skilled players enter smaller. Thanks. Yeah. So this, this concept comes up in a lot of our contest selection con content, um, and the overall thinking here, first of all, let me define effective entrance. So the effective entrance of a contest is the number of total lineups that'll be in the contest divided by the entry limit for one person to place into that contest. Uh, it essentially would say if everybody in this contest was maxing it out, how many unique players would there be here, right? So if you have a, uh, hypothetically, if you have a 10, a 10 lineup contest, a 10 entrant contest, and it's a two max, you would have five effective entrants there. Five people could hypothetically max that contest out. And we always recommend that people look for contests that actually have a higher number of effective entrants. 
which is a little bit, I think, counterintuitive, right? A lot of the other content out there uh, recommends to play smaller field contests. Our argument about effective entrance is ultimately that you maximize your expected value. You maximize your, your theoretical ROI in a contest, even if you reduce your raw probability of winning the contest by lowering the impact that the best players in the lobby have in the contest you are playing. So I actually, I built a spreadsheet for this earlier in the NFL season. Um, let me zoom this in a little bit. And a similar question came in during NFL. Um, so I thought I'd bust out this old spreadsheet that we haven't had it out in a while, but I think it's always a good one here uh, to pull out. So these are two different contests that they run on DraftKings during the NFL season. The first down, the $1.20 max and the triple option, which is the $3.3 .3 max. And we're going to make a few different assumptions that I think kind of help demonstrate this here. So uh, the, the first is that there are a thousand people in the lobby that are playing that night that are more skilled than you. And this number will vary, right? But at the end of the day, there's always going to be players that are playing DFS that night that are better than us, unless we are the best DFS player out there, which probably isn't the case for, for any of us here, right? The other assumption we're making is that everyone playing is maxing the contest they are playing in, right? Um, and the more skilled, the, the players that are more skilled than you are playing both of these contests, right? Um, so this assumption here that everyone playing is maxing the contest, I think is probably the weakest assumption here. Um, that's obviously not the case, but ultimately the most skilled players in the lobby are the ones that are more likely to max a contest out. So even if this assumption is not necessarily accurate, uh, as this assumption gets less true, as less people are maxing contests out, the actual conclusion here that we get to actually is more true because the best players are playing more lineups, right? So let's look at this, right? And this basically explains ultimately why this is our approach. So in the first down, it's a $1 per entry. Uh, it's 20 lineups per person. And there's almost 300,000 entries in this contest. Big NFL contest, right? Well, if everybody's maxing this out, right, 20,000 entries in the contest are made by the players that are more skilled than you, right? That is 20 lineups per person in the 1,000 people playing this contest that are, are better on average than you are, right? That is 6.73% of the entries are ultimately made by players that are, are long-term more skilled than you, right? In the triple option, $3 per entry, three lineups per person, only 15,000 entries. Again, you probably have a higher raw probability of winning this contest. But in this case, 3,000 entries are made by more skilled players, right? That's 15, that's um, 1,000 times three, right? And that makes up 20% of the entries in the contest. Well, in both of these contests, 20% of the field gets paid out. Now, again, anything can happen on one given slate, but over the long term, it is very difficult actually to, I would say, beat the rake in the triple option when... 20% of the entries in that particular contest are being played by players that, that are more skilled and only 20% of the field gets paid out where you can literally visualize the equity that you have in the payout positions in the first down much more easily. So that's basically the fundamental argument here is that while it, while your raw probability, right? Your raw probability, if you were an average player in this contest of winning it is one divided by 15,000. And in this contest, it's one divided by 297,000, right? Raw probability wise, your, your percent chance of winning this contest is a little bit higher. Even if you adjusted for skill level, your expected value or your theoretical ROI is likely to be higher in this contest over the long term because the total percent of the lineups that the most skilled players are taking up in this particular contest is much lower. And the numbers here can change. This changes based on sports. This changes based on whatever contests are out there. But the conclusion here does not change. So playing DFS with this contest selection strategy does expose you to a little bit more higher variance. You probably are going to have a little bit more swings, but it maximizes your ROI in the long term. So that's kind of why overall our approach in general is to be careful with your bankroll, right? To, to use strong bankroll management, but to play these contests where you can get the maximum ROI over the long term. So that is the, uh, I guess, kind of the walkthrough of, of where this, this line of thinking comes through, comes from with the effective entrance. So, but great question. And it's been a while since we've, we've really kind of dove deep into that. So was glad that one came up here today. Um, okay, cool.
Let's keep it going. We got a ton of questions here to talk about here today. So let's just keep ripping forward here. Uh, good one from Brendan about late swap and sliders. Um, and uh, he said, would you discuss the potential ramifications of adjusting sliders during late swap as the main slate progresses? I've read some discussion in NBA about reducing, uh, moving leftward the sliders as the night continues. Thoughts on these sorts of adjustments? Yeah, so uh, good question. I've talked about this a little bit here before. Um, I think the most compelling argument or, or the, the main reason why I would adjust my sliders at all when late swapping uh, are, are there's it's twofold. The first is if there is significant news that is broken throughout the night. Uh, if there is a significant value play that has opened up or a couple different values that have opened up uh, because a player got late scratched, right? At that point in the slate, I don't care so much about, let me, let me pull up the sliders here. I don't care so much about um, the ownership fade or the variance sliders in particular, because on the ownership fade standpoint, first of all, I know that the field isn't going to late swap optimally to that. Um, and second of all, even if they wanted to, because of the way that positions and salary are already tied up in a lineup, uh, the field isn't going to be able to get to optimal ownership on the elite value plays that have opened up. So I will, if a big value has has opened up, I will often turn down the ownership fade slider. Similarly, on the sim variance, if there is now an elite 8x value that has opened up in the late games that wasn't there at lock, I want to maximize the amount, the exposure to that player I can get in my lineups, and I don't want, I don't want to have the variance slider too high so that I artificially lower the potential exposure I can get to that player. Because most of the time, you can't even get to the optimal exposure yourself, right? If there's a player that at lock would have been in 100% of your lineups um, that only opened up after half the slate was already over, you might only be able to get to maximum, you may only be able to get to a maximum of 50% exposure to that player because of the remaining roster spots and salary you have in your lineup. I don't want to further limit that, I guess what I'm saying, by either the ownership fade slider or the sim variance slider. I typically won't turn these all the way down to like zero, right? I don't want to just start using average projections. I still want to allow some some diversity into my lineup, some variance. Uh, but I will I will generally consider turning down both the ownership fade slider and the sim variance slider as the night has gone on, uh, provided that there is big news that has broken. The one other situation where I will adjust the sliders overall is if I'm having a particular outlier night on one end or the other. Um, if I am having a really bad night, if it looks like it's going to be like maybe a, a donation kind of night, I will actually turn these up to try to win back some min cash equity, right? Um, if I'm losing all of my lineups, if a lot of my highest exposed plays have had really bad nights, I would rather late swap into some one or 2% owned plays to try to win back some min cash equity and try to win back some of my investment on the slate. Um, similarly, if I'm crushing and we're heading into like some of the last games of the night, maybe just the night slate games, uh, and maybe if I have a legitimate bink sweat or something like that, I will also then consider turning these down. A lot of times, if you have lineups that are in the top 1% as you're heading into the night games, it often means you already have some very low owned players in that lineup that have gone off. At that point, I'm more interested in shifting into the best overall projected plays in the rest of the lineup. Uh, to try to maximize my percent chance to have a top one finish or something like that. Um, to me, those are the main two situations where I make those adjustments. It's not something I do every slate. Um, I do think there is an argument to be made overall that because you are not building a lineup pool when you late swap, Right? You are naturally increasing the variance of your lineups when you late swap because we're only late swapping the number of lineups you have. We're not building, right? Let's let me do this here real quick. So if we're late swapping 46 lineups, all that's going to happen is we are re rebuilding each lineup once, right? So when we do our original build, we build 500 and we select for the best 46 out of them, which smooths out the variance of that selection. In a late swap build, we are only late swapping each lineup once. So you're just rebuilding 46 lineups. The set of simulations you get for a given lineup is how that lineup will be swapped. It increases your variance slightly. The, the caveat to that or the other side of that is that as the player pool itself decreases and there are less overall choices for the lineup to be swapped into, 
uh, there you're exposed to a little bit less less variance, right? If the pool is is half the size, um, your 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 options for who that line who how that lineup could be swapped also go down. And I think overall, um, I, I'm generally kind of pretty comfortable with that trade off. That yes, while I'm late swapping, I'm increasing the variance because I'm just choosing a set of sims once and then swapping that lineup. Um, as the player pool gets smaller and the the late swap opportunities in the lineup also decrease, I, I think it kind of is an even trade there, at least from my perspective. And I'm pretty comfortable with that trade most of the time. So that's what I do uh, for my for my sliders when I'm late swapping. Again, big news breaking. I will typically turn the ownership fade and sim variant sliders down to capitalize on that as best I can. And if I'm having an outlier performance in one direction or the other, I will turn the sliders up or down from there. So, but great question. And for now, let's jump over to YouTube chat. Get caught up here. James, I see your question in office hours. We'll get back to you here. I want to hit some of these questions that have come in since the start of the stream in, in YouTube here. Uh, first off, from B Swifty, when you change your style play in build settings too, how come the sliders don't say consistent when switching back and forth? Um, I don't know what you mean. They seem to, to me. I maybe maybe uh, you can give me a little more info here. What you mean? How come the sliders don't say consistent? I guess uh, maybe. Were you talking like this? So like if we're at, okay, I think I see it now. So if we're at like twenty max, one thousand to ten thousand, and then switch to cash, and then switch back, it takes us to the ten to fifty k. Um, that might just be a minor little bug there. I think the twenty max, ten to fifty k sliders are kind of what we treat as the the like true defaults, like the basic GPP defaults. So I think it's just switching it back there. Um, I do think though, if we do like. And also, I guess, because cash doesn't have an entry limit or an entrance that matters, you just always play the optimal in cash, it goes away. But it should, like if we go to satellite, oh yeah. Okay, that's a bug. That's a good find. Minor bug there that the entrance is changing even when only the style changes. So good catch. Get that fixed. Um, and then a question from T here. Does the builder ignore player status when using other projections? When I use run pure projections, I still get players marked out in lineups. Uh, when they when I use Saber, they are removed. Yeah, this is a this is a run pure specific thing that's also a little bit of a bug. This is something that we should have fixed um like ASAP this week. Um it's a it's kind of a, a little minor thing that has to do with how run pure uploads their projections. Um that is is on our radar to fix. So um, and then B Swifty said, I was fooling around with some college basketball builds this past week because I thought there would be good tournaments when the actual tournament starts. Will you guys have actual rankings for that? We don't have college basketball sims at the moment. And we're likely not going to be able to have them for this season. Uh, we're in a big push to get ready for baseball now that we have an opening day date. So it wasn't something that we were able to find the time for this season. I do think it is our goal to have them ready for the start of next season, um, provided that everything kind of stays on schedule here. So um, Eric is a, a bit of a college basketball shark. So I think he uh, will be pretty involved with us getting Sims up and projections and things like that for college basketball. Um, so pretty excited about that. But I, I don't think, unfortunately, for March Madness this year, that we're going to have that on our end. Um, you can, of course, if you would like to use SaberSim to build your lineup, still upload custom projections uh, and build lineups with SaberSim from there. Uh, but we don't have our own Sims or um, projections of our own here. So, um, okay, cool. And then uh, T said, "Can you explain how SaberSim uses custom projections? Sometimes I use custom projections and ownership from another so source. Will I defeat the purpose of SaberSim by changing so many numbers?" Thanks. Absolutely not. Um, the way this works, and this is true, this is true no matter how you go about editing your custom projections. So if you are uploading an entirely separate set of projections and changing every single player in the pool, it works this way. If you are changing a specific player's projection, it works this way. And if you are changing a team total and adjusting a team to up or down, it works this way. What happens is we will take the difference between the player's average projection and your new custom projection, right? In this case, we dropped Giannis by five points, right? So there's a minus five point difference there. And then we will take every single game simulation we have for that player's game and drop their output in that individual sim by the same number of points. 
So in this case, Giannis's mean projection went down five points. His floor game, where he scored 35 points, now he scores 30. In his ceiling game, where he scored 100 points, now he scores 95, right? And when we select four individual simulations or sets of simulations when we build your lineups, everything has now been adjusted based on where your custom projections are set. Um, this ultimately, another way of thinking about this, this ultimately has the impact of taking Giannis's entire range of outcomes and shifting it five points to the left in this case. So you still get to take advantage of all of the simulations. You get to take advantage of the different distributions um, in sports that have complicated or, or not normal distributions like NASCAR or MMA, for example. Uh, you're still getting to take advantage of that. We've just shifted the distributions one direction or the other. So um, very common question. You absolutely are not uh, defeating the purpose of SaberSim here um, by using custom projections. You are, of course, um, at the, the mercy of the quality of those projections, right? Um, if you were to go in here and, you know, make a ton of adjustments that were, that were bad, um, your lineups will be worse off. But you do not defeat the purpose of SaberSim by using custom projections. So... Uh, Dante said, how much different is your process in a 20 max versus 150 max? Uh, virtually no different. Like I would say essentially uh, apart from assuming that I'm like imagining a situation where I'm playing either a 20 max or a 150. The only thing that I would say is really different about what I actually do would be the difference in the sliders that are selected. That is pretty much it. Um, in reality, a lot of times on a given slate, I will be playing 150 maxes and 20 maxes. Um, and a lot of times I kind of just group those two together and play them all in a similar way. I'll do a similar build that accounts for, or I'll do the, I'll build all those lineups together. So the process wise, strategically, I have virtually no difference to me. So I do think there's definitely a better argument to be made that single entry and three entry max versus 20 max or 150 max can play a little bit differently. Um, I ultimately still end up grouping all of those together and play them somewhat similarly, um, especially during NBA season, right? NBA news and final Sims and stuff like that, that all happens so late up against lock that it's sometimes just a challenge alone to just get everything in, in time. I don't have enough time to also think about what my specific, my single entry versus my 150 max strategy is going to be on the slate because I'm trying to, to capture as much information as possible um, in, you know, maybe NFL, for example, where things are generally kind of final an hour before kickoff. I think you can be a little more particular about what's your single entry approach versus what's your multi-entry approach. Um, but for, for NBA, I, I, I think overall my contest selection mix is kind of just all one bucket that I'm, I'm building for everything all at once. So. Josh said 25 players questionable today. No need to start building lineups now. Yeah. Uh, the, the, it is uh, It is always funny during NBA season when I'm doing these streams because everything is just like purely an example for that moment in time when I'm trying to demonstrate something. And it's like stuff is virtually use, useless an hour from now. Um, so yes, if you were watching this from the start, um, please don't necessarily think that by the time it comes time to build lock that Amir Coffey and Luke Kennard are the two elite value plays and the, the best fade on the uh, high end is LaMelo ball because everything's likely to, to change pretty quickly. So um, Brad said on DK is value for a player still considered five X salary. And how are those found in other sports? Um, I would, I would caution you away from thinking about the, value in that way as something that's like super useful, I guess. Um, the main reason why is it's, it's basically just a different representation of the average projection and average projections are not predictive of upside in basketball. They are probably more predictive of upside than any other sport because players are generally pretty normally distributed, right? Um, you can kind of predict Giannis's 95th percentile outcome. For example, if you knew his, his mean and his, and his standard deviation, like pretty, pretty well. Um, but looking overly hunting value, uh, I think is, is dangerous overall. Um, just because it, it's not going to overall show you what the, the best plays or the highest upside plays on the slate are. 
Uh, the other problem with value is that it's it's going to be overly centered towards low salary players, right? So if you were saying, you know, value is 5X, every player that's worth playing on a NBA slate is, is over 5X. Well, there's a big difference between a 3,700 salary player being projected for 5X and a uh, 12,000 salary player being projected for 5X, right? Because there's a, there's a certain value to raw fantasy point production since you can only roster eight players. You need a certain amount of raw value. Um, the other problem with value here is that it's, it's contest agnostic, right? Um, or let me say this. The other problem with using value as a way to decide what players are good plays are, is, is it is contest agnostic, right? There are, um, you know, in a single entry, a small field single entry, it might be uh, a bad idea to play a 4.4x projected player at any salary. In a large field GPP, where you get a ton of ownership leverage, have a better chance of making a unique lineup, right? Um, that player may be firmly in play. So if you are interested in kind of using value to determine what the best overall plays are, I would instead use a test build right? Build a set of lineups, build a big pool with the uh, build settings that match the contest you are playing and see what kind of players you are getting exposure to, right? That will give you a better idea of what the overall best plays on the slate are. Um, I think value is really just a very quick way to get an idea of where maybe some pricing inefficiencies are on the slate, but I would, I would definitely caution you against overly keying into it as a tool to make a strategic decision about the way to play the slate so but good question so here i mean here's our here's our 20 max right and you can see there's 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 a spectrum of value here right like in general especially in nba a lot of times the best value plays are still going to be the best plays but we do have Giannis, who isn't traditionally a value play uh, because he's 4.76 at 12K. And if you do this in a sport like NASCAR or MMA, I just keep going back to those two, two examples because they're on my mind, right? Oftentimes the best value play in those sports is, is not even close to an efficient play in a particular contest. I actually think we gave that example explicitly in this video with Matt when we were talking about our NASCAR Sims um, after Daytona. Um, it was a uh, villain a wave was like our overall best projected value play. And he showed up in very, very little lineups when you ran a test build because he had no upside, even though he is on average was projected for a lot. So, but good question. Um, just something that I would proceed with caution on. And I guess specifically about this question, right? Um, like is, is 5X, is, is, is 5X, actually, I, I think I've, I've made this point enough. I think I've, I've, I've made this point kind of clear. So we'll, we'll move on from there. But let me know if there's any other kind of follow-up there. Um, all right, let me jump back uh, to the Office Hours channel in Slack. We'll hit this question quickly from James here. Uh, he said, I know it's a crazy question, but can you go over how to import my lineups for draft pins? I've been manually putting them in. I don't have enough time to put in my 20 lineups, and thanks. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That, that would be painful. I can't imagine entering um, these... Oh, I can't imagine entering these contests in uh, manually here. Um, let me, I will show you how to do this here. Let me real quick, let me start fresh. So I'm going to log out from this account and log into a different other one here um, so that we can start fresh. So we, we created our entry editor to make this process far, far easier than having to manually key all your lineups in or mess around with the CSVs. So let's see here. So first off, James, the, the first thing you'll want to do is reserve your, your lineup, your contests, right? You'll want to make sure that you are entered into contests that you want to play that particular night. Um, so I guess, James, maybe let me know if you know how to do that. Um, I would be happy to kind of demo how to reserve contests as well. I am going to assume that you you know how to how to reserve. Um, if you don't, we'll back up. We'll talk about that real quickly. But I'm going to start from you've reserved the entries into the contest you want to play. You have dummy lineups into those contests, and you have an entries file that you can download. Right. Um, the easiest way to 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 test this, especially you know maybe if you don't know if you have that, 
is to go to the entries tab, right? And then what you do is you click this download template file from DraftKings. This is going to start a download of that entries file, right? It's gonna be a, a CSV file that has all of the, the contests that you're playing in it. And you can just go ahead and drag and drop it into here. So from here, right, we've got a list of all the contests that I'm playing tonight. So I've got, you can see here, I've got my list of, of contests for the main slate. I've got um, a couple 20 maxes, all these single entries. Um, again, the, the, the Sabersim League here, right? Everything's loaded in here. Then all I need to do is, hang on. Okay. And now I just need to build my lineups for these contests, right? So in this case, I'm just going to build 46 lineups, right? This would be the actual process of building your lineups just like you normally do on a normal slate, right? So we'll give this just a second to build. And give that a second to load. Now I've got my 46 lineups, right? So maybe you edit your exposures, your projections, whatever. You get your lineups finalized. You're ready to get them into your contests. You go back to the entry editor. And then you're just going to click fill contest with lineups, right? This is the process of getting the lineups from the build into the entries. So we click this. I would recommend if you're just getting started out with the entry editor to just build a unique lineup for, actually, I guess in your case, it sounds like you're just playing 20 lineups um, in a 20 max. So it won't really matter what you choose here. You can choose any of these, but assuming that you're playing multiple contests, just for example, what I would recommend if you're just getting started out is build a number of lineups here that matches this number, your total entries you're playing, right? So I have 46 and then just use the unique random fill. That's going to put a unique lineup into every single contest. If you want to know more, I guess, once you get a little more familiar, if you want to know more about what each of those different fill methods do, if you click this little tooltip, it'll pop up this short little four minute video where I explain what those all do in a little more detail. But for starters, the unique random will work perfectly fine. Now you can see, right, we're all entered. We've got our exposures populated. All of our lineups are showing up here. And we can just click download all entries and then download and open DraftKings. And it's gonna download the file up here and it's going to take you right to the right page on DraftKings where you upload that file. So then you click upload CSV and then click the file and we're in. 46 lineups all uploaded. We did not have to key anything in manually here. So let me know if that helped. Um, again, I kind of picked this up from you having already registered for your contest. Um, if you would like me to demo how to register for contests or how to reserve entries, I'd be happy to do that as well. So, but. Cool. Um, Question from Don here, for 25 max tourney, what's the key? That contest seems harder and not many sharks. I actually like that 25 max on FanDuel. Um, I, it, it can be sharp. It can be a little deceptively sharp. It, it's under $3. So people with a million dollars or more in lifetime winnings, I think that's how FanDuel does it as well. I know that's how DraftKings does it. Um, but there, there's a, a softer overall pool of players that have access to that contest. But it fluctuates from about 13,000 to 20 or so thousand entries, right? So the effective entrance number is a little bit lower. I think tonight it's a 25 max with uh, 13,000 entrance. So in theory, um, you know, there's only about 500 effective entrants in there. It'd be very easy for 500 people to come in and max that out, right? So it's, it's, I think it can be deceptively a little bit sharper than people might think, um, even, though they're, even though it's under that $3 limit. As far as a key, there there really is no key, right? The key is that there is no key. I mean, in, in terms of like, what's the secret to, to to binking on any given night? I think it's a good contest to play. It's in my contest selection mix on FanDuel. Um, 
I, I would say that the same principles that we talk about for overall NBA strategy still apply into that contest. Um, I would build lineups at the sliders that are optimized for that particular contest. I would be very much prepared to late swap. If you ask me overall to say one thing that I think is the key to NBA DFS success overall, it is late swapping and being prepared to late swap when news breaks. Um, and I think that's that that's the the key to success if there is one is you know build lineups that are are well leveraged and well correlated um, and have the right amount of variance for that contest, right? I'm basically saying, you know, use the right kind of sliders, get your, your pool built here, um, and then and then be prepared to swap when news breaks. Take advantage of the, the value plays that open up as the slate goes on. So. Um, all right, cool. Question from top here in Slack. Um, he said, late game players always seem to score higher. Is that data you guys have or taken into account? If so, how would you think this going into a slate like tonight from a GPP standpoint? Uh, well, okay. There's two questions here. I'll handle that one first. So there, there's there's not really any reason to believe that players in late games actually historically do score more than players playing in the early games. Um, if you have players in late games that are playing in games that have the highest totals on the night, of course, on average, those are going to be the highest scoring games. But the game start time in a vacuum does not affect the player projections. And it shouldn't. Like there's no, there's no historical reason to believe that's predictive. There is, there's two points I want to make here. There's a cognitive bias here where if you are, it will often feel like you are always getting caught by players playing in the late games because the games do play out in a chronological order, right? Um, or, you know, it, it, especially if you, I, let me put it this way, if you are building lineups that maybe don't have as many players from those games, or you have a lineup that is exceeding that doesn't have players playing in the late game, right? That lineup can only move backwards because there are lineups behind it that have players playing that haven't played yet. But if all the games started at the same time, th there wouldn't be one reason more than the other that a game that was the later game is likely to score higher, right? It just feels that way because of the way that these actually do play out in real time. Um, with that said, in NBA in particular, I think there is additional value to a player the later they are playing in the night because their projection can theoretically change, right? Their projection can get higher if news broke in that particular game. Um, in other words, let me pull up Basketball Monster here tonight and see if we can come up with an example. Okay. So let's see. Okay, so Van Vliet and LeBron are both questionable in this late game. So let's see if we can find someone. Okay, so Pascal Siakam is projected for 40 points playing in this late game, right? Russell Wilson is projected for 33. And now let's jump over to this early game here. Okay. So, okay, yeah, here's here's actually a decent example. So Garland is projected for 37 points, right? And Russell Westbrook is projected for 33 points. And let's assume that those stay exactly the same heading into lock, right? And going into lock, all of the players that are questionable in this game are, are playing. The projections have stayed the same. And LeBron is still questionable for the Lakers, right? There is a strong argument to be made that Russell Westbrook's 30 three projected points are actually more valuable than Darius Garland's 36 projected points at lock because Russell Westbrook's projection has the potential to raise as the slate goes on if LeBron were to get ruled out. Now, determining where that line is, where is the break-even point? Like, what if Russell Westbrook was projected for 24 points? Or what if Darius Garland was projected for 45 points, right? There is a, there's a break-even point there where you know, the two players are hypothetically the same value, but generally players with the same projection are close to the same projection. The players playing in the later game will be more valuable because news can break and news is likely to break, especially in question players games with questionable players. So all other things being equal, I think it's a little bit better in NBA to roster players playing in later games, but that is not because they have some otherwise arbitrary raw higher scoring upside from purely playing in the late games, right? So 
That's why late swap is important. And that's why making late swap flexibility can be important as well. Creating as much flexibility in your lineups as possible by limiting maybe exposure to those early games, maybe limiting your player pool to those early games, uh, maybe building in stacking or grouping rules to force players playing from later games can be important in NBA. But it's not, it is not because there is objectively some reason that a player is projected for more purely for playing in a late game. So, but good question. Even though it is certainly tilting when you get caught by uh, late night hammers um, when you are crushing it with some some early game exposure. But um, yeah, I, I think I think in a sport like I think in a sport like basketball, if you forced players playing in later games into your lineups every single night, because of the late swap flexibility it was giving you, it would actually work out. Even though, even if you were doing that because, even if you were doing that because you always wanted to have like a hammer player playing in the late game, which I don't think is a good idea. I don't think that's sound logic. It would probably work out for you, provided you were also late swapping because you would be creating late swap flexibility in your lineups. In a sport like baseball, for example, right, that would be a bad idea. In baseball, news doesn't break as often and it's not as impactful when it does. So intentionally stacking up teams playing in the late games, just have those hammer games would basically at best be neutral EV. At worst, you would be playing worse lineups purely to have players playing in the late games. So, Cool. Uh, let's see, another question from Don. In a three max, usually one line is also the cash line. Would you suggest more late swapping in the smaller three max and single entries? I would first not. I would first recommend not playing your cash lineup in GPPs, right? Um, I think there is a a fear of missing out that happens with people with with their cash lineups, so they enter them into small field tournaments, right? Those are those are lineups that often in NBA maybe it's. In NBA, maybe there's an argument that I know we were talking about this last week. There's probably an argument you can make that the cash lineup is actually probably viable in smaller field GPPs, um, but I wouldn't recommend doing that um, overall. Right? It, the the a, a cash game lineup is not going to be built for top one percent equity. So yes, any given lineup has some potential to reach its top one percent outcome, but because that lineup isn't built to be profitable in that contest. It's likely over the long term that it's it's going to be unprofitable. In fact, maybe maybe the biggest reason why small field three max and single entries are soft is because so many people are slamming cash lineups into it, right? The main reason we started this show actually today's stream talking about why uh, how to beat small field GPPs, and I mentioned that ownership condenses onto what is perceived to be the best plays on the slate that night. One of the main reasons why that actually happens and why that is something that can be exploited is because so many people play cash lineups into these contests. So I wouldn't do that. Um, in terms of the second question here, would you suggest more late swapping in smaller max and single entries? I recommend late swapping no matter what, for especially for NBA. I would late swap every time news breaks, every time there is something of impact. Um, and if you are unsure of what that actually looks like, I would just late swap before the start of every game. I don't think it's I don't think it's going to to hurt you. I typically kind of track this basketball monster player news tab here and we'll keep an eye out throughout the slate. If there is news about the slate that night that has popped up in this list here, I think it's time to swap. That's how I do it. But otherwise, I think just slate swapping before every game just to make sure you didn't miss anything is great, regardless of whether you're playing smaller max, three entries, single entries, whatever. Um, actually, one of the things I've noticed from people that are playing single entries is that people will say, oh, I don't have that guy in my lineup. I'm good. I think that is the worst idea. I think that's the worst thing. I also think because, you know, with a single entry, you know, you've probably spent a little bit more time hand selecting or hand building or whatever that particular lineup. Um, I think people can kind of fall in love with their lineup that they set at lock. And I would also try to avoid thinking about it that way, right? Think about your lineup at lock as only the players that got locked into the lineup at lock. The rest of it is still open for, for change as the late swap, late swap slate goes on. Um, but even if you don't have the player that got ruled out in your lineup, you should be late swapping, right? So, you know, who's let's see who's questionable here, right? Um, 
I don't know. Is there like a game, a good one here? I guess like this Minnesota value has a potential to open up quite a bit, right? Maybe you never, maybe you never had a, a, a Minnesota player in your single entry lineup at any point throughout the night, right? And you're playing a single bullet and you go through and you get, we, we get to the 630 game and Beverly, Nazreed, Jordan McLaughlin, all these guys all get ruled out at once. And it's taken, um, I don't know, Malik Beasley from like an average 4X play on FanDuel to a 6X projected play, right? That, he might be an elite. He might be an elite play at that price now, right? Or somebody to consider there. Um, and I think it should. It you should swap even if you didn't have Patrick Beverly in your lineup to begin with. So, Brad says, "How often do you ever take into consideration of the blowout?" Um, I don't. Uh, I think two things. One, they are captured well in the individual simulations. Right. That's that's actually part of, I think, what makes the NBA Sims really valuable is that in in football, for example, we'll talk about game script context. And I think it makes a lot of intuitive sense where, you know, a team playing from behind in the fourth, fourth quarter is going to throw the ball a lot. Right. And we capture that in the Sims. We keep track of the score. We keep track of the time on the clock. We do the same thing in in basketball. Right. But in basketball, it's kind of complicated in a blowout situation. Yes, a player is maybe less likely to get minutes. Right. Um, but what about the blowout situations where that player's already, you know, hit their ceiling in three quarters, right? Um, what about a situation where, you know, the, the game script is a little bit more complicated. I also think blowout risk is also in general overrated. I think like even in a game that has a nine, 10, 12 point spread, I think the field overrates how likely the game is to blow out and how likely in particular the game is to blow out in a way that significantly affects the minutes of the players that are in the game. So I don't really think about it above and beyond allowing the Sims to help capture that for me. So it's not a big part of my process beyond that. Young God said, usually when you do a three man, even if it's a GBP, you still get the cash line. I think that's what he's referring to. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and again, I, 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 I think for MBA in particular, like, let's see, let me just show you this real quick. I don't know why I always swap over to DraftKings. It's like reflexive. I always want to do everything on DK. So if we built cash lineups, right. If we if we did this build zero 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 builds right twenty lineups in the twenty lineups here forty in the pool right and compare this to the optimal settings for a three max that's maybe a something like this right when the variance slider comes down to like three or two or one and the ownership fade sliders down to like zero one or two I think it is likely that some of the 20 or 40 cash lineups are probably going to show up in the pool size of 500, right? It's possible that on the right slate, maybe even literally the cash optimal, the single cash optimal is in your first three lineups. I think if that happens, I think that's, that's probably fine, right? That's, it's basically saying that like the cash lineup is so good that it has GPP equity, right? That it's worth playing in GPPs. I think that is fine, especially in a sport like basketball, where average projections are generally a little bit better. They are a little bit more predictive of upside. If you end up playing a lineup inadvertently in your small field, single entry and three max contest, that is the cash optimal that night. I don't think it's like an emergency, but I would, I I guess what I'm saying is I would never intentionally go play my cash lineup into a GPP because I had the fear of missing out because that, that lineup was not, at that point, that lineup was not at, at specifically optimized for that contest, right? If a if a cash lineup or a if a if a lineup is viable both in cash games and in GPPs, which can happen in NBA and small field tournaments, then great. But I would never just assume that my cash lineup has equity in a GPP and just throw it in there just just in case, right? That is a mistake. And where it's particularly a mistake is in higher variance sports, right? Um, and it's a big mistake if you start entering that into larger field tournaments. Um, you'll see this in NFL constantly. There are a ton of people that will build like a one lineup and enter it into a ton of cash games and throw it into huge GPPs. 
and all these other contests. And in reality, that lineup that lineup probably has equity in either cash games. Like it's either a good cash game lineup and not a good tournament lineup, or it's a good tournament lineup and it's a terrible cash game lineup. But there's rarely a good lineup that you can build for almost any sport that is good for all contests, right? Um, I, I I would say, you know, if you ever see somebody that's building one lineup and entering it into like everything, cash games, quintuple ups, boosters, satellites, small field GPPs, large field GPPs, they are almost certainly not playing optimally. So, but B Swifty said, do you think you can late swap too much? Like you get news and late swap two to three mi times, five minutes before the slate starts. Anyway, that could end up bad. Uh, no, I don't think so. Not bad. I mean, at worst, you're just going to basically kind of like spin the, the simulation lever or wheel, I guess, multiple times. Like, I don't think there's any way that that would decrease your expected value. Late swapping multiple times before five minutes before a certain round of game starts. Right. You're, you're going to get different results. You're going to get different lineups. Uh, you could certainly feel bad if you late swapped out of a winner. But if we were to play the slate out 10,000 times, that would probably have no impact on the profitability of your lineups doing that a couple times. And sometimes that happens, right? You know, especially there are situations like this eight o'clock run of games, right? Like, let's say there's questionable players playing in each game. And this happens sometimes where like you're maybe it's five or 10 minutes before this round of games locks and we get some news about this game. And then the sim runs and you late swap to make sure you're capitalizing on it. And then all of a sudden there's a late squat, uh, late scratch, late scratch. Like Zach Levine suddenly gets ruled out for the bulls at the last second. The sim runs and you late swap again. I, I actually, in that particular example, you're probably adding value, right? If no news is breaking and you run multiple late swap builds, I think at worst you are neutral EV. If more news is coming out and you're updating to account for that, you're probably plus EV. So. And then uh, B Swifty said, if you're doing multiple winner take all single entries, would you enter the same lineup multiple times or make small changes? Um, assuming I am, assuming they are all pretty, I would say like similar stakes, similar prize pools, similar entrance, I would probably put a unique lineup into each of them. Um, I, I I probably wouldn't go the route of like building one lineup and shifting it all slightly, I would probably actually like, let's say you were playing three of them, right? You're playing three winner take alls. I would probably, so I like to use the satellite settings for winner take alls because they're basically the same thing, right? I would probably, I would set the sliders to what they are. So, you know, maybe it's a single entry, right? I know there's like some of these smaller field winner take alls, like maybe it's something like this, right? I would probably build like this and I would legitimately play three unique lineups into each of them. Assuming they were all similar stakes, right? Similar prize pools, similar number of entrants, right? If if you're playing a winner take all that's a thousand to first and a winner take all that's a hundred to first, right? You may be a little less comfortable doing this because that's a big difference in your potential payout if one lineup ends up in one contest versus the other. But if you're playing three different winner take alls that are all a hundred dollars to first, I would probably do this put a unique lineup into each especially since those are so top heavy right like you don't really need to win all three on the same night even though that would be nice right i would rather get three shots at it every single night with the opportunity to win one so and then don said i'm sure this has been asked before but the changes saber makes after lock would you suggest those swaps or our own uh that's only if the player isn't locked already uh i i would always recommend using saber sims late swap tool to make your, your swaps yourself, right? Mostly because when news breaks, right? And player projections change and the way the simulations are gonna change, the way we're expecting both teams to change, there's a lot of information to kind of just keep track of all at once, right? How the slate looks as a whole has kind of changed if there's, if there's significant news that is broken. And I think it's difficult, at least it would be for me to kind of think quickly and as quickly as you need to, to be successful in NBA about what the new best strategies are for that particular slate. The nice thing when you're late swapping with Saberson is that when you come in here and, and swap, right, we will rebuild the best possible lineups while keeping track of all the other things that you need to keep track of here, like correlation, ownership, like the variance, 
right? All of that. So when you rebuild, you get to capture all of that updated information and get those new elite plays into your lineups, but also track all of the things that are otherwise important for for uh, for GP, for success in GPPs. And you know, sometimes if if value has opened up in one game. Right, that may make it more possible to get more exposure to a like a star playing in a different game that you might not have thought about if you were trying to just make that one to one swap on your own. So, if I'm understanding this correctly, I would always recommend using the late swap tool itself to do these swaps rather than trying to hand build your lineups and account for updated information. Just because I think the builder is just going to be way more efficient at doing it. But I might be misunderstanding this question. So, if I am, let me know. But I, I I would between the options of hand building to late swap or late swapping with SaberSim, I would always I would always swap with the app. Um oh yeah, I missed top second question. My bad. Let me hit this one real quick. Um he said the cash lines in Express always end up doing well in the GPP. What can take Express to a takedown because it seems like playing cash is better than GPPs? Let's see. The cash in lines in Express always end up... Okay. So here's what I expect is happening, right? Let's do let's do an experiment here, right? So let's actually, since you said Express, let's hop over to FanDuel, right? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to build cash lineups for this slate, and then I'm going to build GPP lineups for this slate, and we're going to compare the projected score of these. And then I'll talk about why we're doing this. So let's do this first. So the best cash game lineups you could hypothetically play for the 730 Express on Fandle tonight at the moment with the way the projections are would give you a projection of... 321.3 321.3 points. Now let's say hypothetically you were playing a GPP, right? And let's see, you know, something like this. Let's see what we get. So 321.3. Okay. 318.7 is the best overall lineup we could play if we were playing the GPP. So we are sacrificing five projected points. What that literally means is that on average, the cash lineup is going to score more than the GPP lineup, right? The reason why we want to sacrifice some average expectation in our GPP lineups is because we are not optimizing for the average outcome, right? We are optimizing for the top 1% outcome because that's where all the money is in these contests, right? So yes, if you are playing, if you are comparing how cash lineups are doing versus GPP lineups are doing in something like a two game express slate, you are probably going to find that the average score on average of the cash lineups is higher than the average score of the GPP lineups. But those cash lineups have no real percent chance to place in the top 1% where all the money is, right? Building a lineup to min cash or even to to 3x cash in GPPs is inefficient because you're getting you're getting terrible odds on that basically, right? Someone's paying you two to one on an event that if they're only, let's say only the top 20% of the field gets paid out, right? You're getting two to one odds on an event that's only going to happen one out of five times on average, right? Where you cash in the top 20%, right? The money in a GPP is all centered in that top 1% or sometimes even smaller than that. So it makes sense to build lineups that have a high percent chance of, of scoring that. To do that, you have to accept some plays into your lineups that are lower owned, right? Or have a higher variance outcome that have you know lower floors, lower average projections, but still have very high ceiling, which is basically what happens here in this particular case, right? We have this lineup. So again, we sacrificed five projected points, but in this case, we have a cumulative ownership of four hundred fifty-five percent 
whereas the cash lineup had a cumulative ownership of, let's see here, 487%, right? This is a chalkier lineup. This lineup has a lower overall upside to take first, for example, in this particular contest, even though it is going to score higher on average. This is true of everything. This doesn't just have to be for two-game express slates for NBA. The cash lineups have a higher average projection, which means they are going to score more raw fantasy points on average. But because they will often be higher owned, they are also probably not correlated, right? Correlation doesn't really matter for a two-game express slate, but for, you know, a football main slate or something like that, correlation is extremely important. You sacrifice average expectation to build lineups that have a higher than average percent chance of finishing in the top 1%. But finishing in the top 1% is a rare outcome, right? A lineup is on average theoretically 20 times more likely to cash at all than it is to cash specifically in the top 1%. And that can be confusing, right? If you are, it can feel as if the optimal strategy or a better way to play a contest is to play a chalkier cash lineup because it will feel like you are winning more, but you are actually just losing to the rake over the long term. So that is why I would say in general, like a cash, a, a cash lineup is going to outperform a GPP lineup in theory on average, even though it is a lower expected value lineup in the long term. Because this lineup, the, the GPP lineup really only needs to take first the one time and it outperforms the cash lineup forever. So. Uh, and then some said, what's the best way to fade a player you don't necessarily want in your late swap? For example, Olivier Saar ended up in my lineups after a late swap and I didn't want exposure to him. Um, I would just uncheck him in the entries tab. So let's go back over. Let me go to where I actually have some entries loaded here. So. Yeah, let's say, I don't know. Let's say you're late swapping and you don't want one of these guys for one reason or another, right? Just uncheck them here. They won't show up in there anymore. I know we've been high on, on SAR recently. So that's a pretty good example of one maybe that you just want to remove. You could also set a maximum exposure, right? So like one thing you can do or one thing that I kind of like to do is especially if huge news broke, Right. Uh, is I will run kind of a test late swap and see who am I getting. So run a late swap as if you were going to use that build, but see what the exposures look like. And if you're getting like a ton of a player that you didn't really want, or even some of a player that you didn't really want, you can go in and check them, right? I mean, be careful with that because they're they're probably a good play. But you could also come back and then set a maximum exposure, right? Like let's say, you know, let's say all those Timberwolves get ruled out and all of a sudden you're getting like 60% Anthony Edwards and you want some Anthony Edwards, but you don't want all that Anthony Edwards. You can also come in here and set a maximum exposure of like 30% and then swap again. So either way, either way is a good way to do it. Uh, Dante said, are you more likely to decrease a player's projection or take them out of your pool in NBA? By far decrease the projection. I almost never remove players from my pool beyond whatever my, my player filter set at, right? M removing players from your pool is just a really extreme approach. It's basically like setting, I mean, it's setting a max exposure of zero. You are getting, you will get none of that player. It leaves no room for error, right? One thing that's nice about decreasing a player projection is that it, it, it gives you some flexibility, right? Um, for example, we were getting a ton of Amir coffee as we were doing these builds today, right? Looks like, looks like a pretty elite value. And maybe you ran those and you said, wow, I'm getting a ton. I'm getting a ton of this guy, right? And I, I want to fade, right? Or I want to be under the field. You could come in here and say, you know what? Let's drop his projection down to 24, right? That's a pretty significant drop. That's a, uh, you know, five, five fantasy point projection for a guy projected for 30, right? That's a pretty big drop. And then we come in here and build. And let's just build 20 lineups. And we can see how much we get, right? Certain situations, this might be the same as having unchecked him, 
you might still get 100% exposure to him if he's still a really good play, right? It just allows a little bit more room for flexibility here with your overall player pool to change projections instead of unchecking players. So in this case, right, this is an interesting example here where the builder is saying that for a 20 max, 10 to 50K entrance, even if Coffee's real mean projection is 24 points instead of 29, and knowing that he could be 53% owned, at least as it's projected now, he's still worth having in almost half of your lineups for this particular build. So I, I love having that information. Now I know, right? It goes to show a little bit of how good of a play he is, at least as it's projected right now at 1.30 my time, right? Which things can change quite a bit. But it, it definitely goes to show how, how good of a play he is on tonight's slate with how things are projected now, given that if he was even, even if he was owned 53% of the lineups, when his projection comes down five points, he's still worth putting in half of your lineups. So, uh, Beast 50 said, Do you have certain plays or players you favor or can't help but get some action every time they play? Just a personal rooting interest. Just curious, excited for Jokic and Embiid tonight. Um, I. I okay. I mean, I have players I like. Obviously, um, I have players that I I don't like as well. I have players that like. There are certain situations where if I see them in my lineups, I'm like, oh, like is this going to be the guy that like I allow to kill my lineups tonight? What I'm I, I'm probably gonna I'm gonna I I'm probably gonna piss somebody off here right now before I say this, but the guy the first guy that pops into my head for that is Jason Tatum. Every time I'm over the field on Jason Tatum, I'm like, this is going to go horribly. I am not the biggest Tatum fan. He seems to let me down over and over again. Um, and I don't like seeing him in my lineups. I am, I mean, I'm a Nuggets fan, so I'm a huge uh, Jokic fan. I'm also, in general, very happy being over the field on Embiid. Um, overall, in my process, I don't allow that to influence me very often. Um, not because it's necessarily wrong or right, right? Um I, I just will typically, even if I'm like, I guess it's a Tatum night, I'll probably just end up playing him if he's projected that well. I'll trust the Sims. Um, with that said, though, I don't think there's anything wrong with allowing a little bit of that into your process. I would particularly allow that into your process in step three. So I, I've actually talked about this a lot here on stream before. The more objectively confident you are in your decision, to be over or under on a player, the more you could, the more you could argue your point, like statistically or from data, and say this guy, I think this guy's a good or a bad play because of this. The more I'm comfortable doing that in step one, but that doesn't mean there's no place for intuition at all in the Saberson process. And I think people don't don't always realize that. If you wanted to make an intuitive stand, right? If you do that in step three as opposed to in step one, what you are basically saying is. Saber Sim, tell me the best 500 lineups that I can play. And then I'm going to specifically choose the ones that have exposure to the plays that I want to root for, right? But you're playing from a pool of lineups that's already optimized and viable for the contest. So if you go in, you know, if you go in in step one and say, I'm excited for Jokic and Embiid, I want to play these guys. I think they're going to play hard. And for those reasons alone, bump both of their projections up. You've kind of adjusted the system. You're changing the projections themselves. Of course, you're going to get a lot of those players. But in step three, you can go in here instead and say, of this pool of 500 lineups that are optimized for this contest, give me a set of lineups that makes me over over that makes me over the field on these two guys, right? So let's say Jokic, I want 20%, right? And Embiid, I want 15%. I want to be 2x the field on both of these guys, right? Boom. And all we've done there now is we've selected for a pool, we've selected 20 lineups from our pool of 500 of which all 500 are viable for the contest that have these exposures to these players in them, right? So I think kind of the takeaway here, and I, I, I really I really recommend thinking about it like this, is the more you are confident in that stand, and the more I would say, the way I like to think about it is how easily could I argue this stand to somebody who really needed to be convinced of this, right? Is how compelling of an argument is, well, Jokic and Embiid are in the MVP race, and they're both going to play hard, right? In terms of like a reason to adjust a projection. Some of you may disagree with me. I don't think that's a very compelling reason in terms of like arguing this to somebody else of why they should listen to you. But that doesn't mean you don't have to listen to that for your own lineups. And if you're going to do that, make those adjustments in step three. Now, if instead, you know, that, let me give you a counter example, right? Maybe you have, um, 
like a data driven argument um, that I don't even know. My, my brain's failing me here on this, but um, you know, maybe, maybe it's an injury thing, right? There's a data driven argument of why maybe Jokic becomes a better play on a projection level. If Aaron Gordon and Zeke Naji get ruled out, right? Like that would be to me a little bit more of a data driven, especially this game doesn't like this game doesn't start at lock, right? So maybe you say, I'm going to, bump Jokic's projection a bit to make sure that I have enough ability to get to him in the event that both of these guys get ruled out and his projection goes up, right? That I think is a little bit more of an objective argument in terms of, in terms of why you would want to increase his projection. So I think that's, I think that is an underrated part of the Saberson process that, that actually I, like I probably don't even talk about enough is that it's okay to make some more intuitive stands or to make some gut call type stands. But when you're doing that, do that in step three where you're working from a pool of lineups that's already viable for the contest. Because you'll be you'll you 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 can't lose, right? You're pick, you're picking lineups that you're picking lineups that were already built without without saying I want to force Jokic in, right? So, anyway, I think I made that that point kind of clear here enough, but I th- I think that's I think that's a really cool part of the process here. Um, and like in, in um, I will do this sometimes if I'm going to the game, right? Like let's back up here. Like if I was going, I actually, this game's in Philly, right? But I'm not, I'm, I'm in, um, I'm in the Denver area, right? So if I was going to this game and I was just like, you know, for fun, maybe I'm playing a little lighter that night and I just want to go all in on Jokic, right? This is how I would do it. Because I don't have a good reason to say I want 100% Jokic from a projection standpoint. I don't want to adjust the projections. But I'm going, I'm playing 20 lineups. I want a little bit of a sweat. I want to root for my guy. Give me the top 20 of my pool of 500 that include Jokic in it. Boom, done. These lineups were already good without the bias of Jokic established in step one. So anyway, enough said there. Let's keep it going. Um, We are cruising today. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, asking questions. Um, Got a hour and 40 minutes or so in here already. So um, Don said, I had a takedown with Sabre last week when I locked four players in smash spots. Do you think finding that slash those players is too risky to lock players consistently? Um, he also said, last question, I promise. Don't worry. Yes, yeah, questions as long as you got them. That's that's what I'm here for. Um, I think that's fine. I, it's a very risky approach. That's a, that is, I mean, what you, what you are doing is you're basically, you know, you're taking a core of th- four guys in this case and you're, covering a lot of different situations outside of those guys, right? Like these four guys are going to go off and I'm going to cover as many possible situations for all the other players in the lineup. Um, It's a very risky approach, right? If any one of those players in your core doesn't live up to expectations, you're pretty much sunk in a hundred percent of your lineups for that particular slate. Um, I don't particularly play like that very often. Um, I think you can justify playing more risky like that. The less lineups you're playing, Right? If you're just playing 10 lineups, it's not as big of a deal to lock four guys into all 10. If you're playing 150, that is that is a lot of lineups with those four guys in them. Um, so I I think I think this is more this is less about strategy and more about your personal risk tolerance. Um, I talk to players on this stream all the time that love playing this kind of strategy. And I also have regularly get questions from people who are uncomfortable with having hundred percent exposure to even one player. Um, I would match your approach to this is perfectly fine from a strategic standpoint. I would match this to your personal risk tolerance and, and ask yourself, are you comfortable basically saying that like a hundred percent of your lineups could just be dead in the water immediately. If any of those lineups in your core or any of those guys in your core fail. So, but you have a, very, very high upside potential if you are right on those guys. So Brad said, I feel like it's a must as a DFS player to have specific guys you hate playing no matter what. Yeah. And it depends on the sport. It's like different on a sport to sport basis. I would, I'm curious like who else pops into my head. Um, but let me see if there's any names tonight just cause we're, uh, we're, um, we're having fun here today. Um, yeah, Tatum is like the big one for me. I don't know why, but I hate playing Tatum. I also, I guess, maybe to a lesser extent, like 
I always, I, I, I never feel too great about being really heavy on Giannis for whatever reason. I think it's just like, and he, I don't know. It's just very easy for him to not play a lot of minutes. And that's actually even factored in here, right? This is a good thing to look at, but you can kind of see it, right? Giannis's average minutes projection is like 33 minutes, 34 for Jokic, 35 for Embiid, almost 36 for LeBron. Like we kind of, we capture that, that difference in minutes there. And he's still the best overall projected play on the slate. But I always, that one, that one doesn't even, that one doesn't hold a candle to the Tatum though. Cause I, that's like definitely probably my least favorite NBA DFS play ever is when I'm really invested into Tatum. So. But yeah, I don't know. Brad said, I've already found my NASCAR guy for the season. Chastain, he will be the bane of my downfall on NASCAR. Yeah, he, uh, I didn't play this week's race. I was out of town, but I know we were really high on him and then he wrecked like a week ago. So Don said Westbrook. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. West Westbrook's a good one. Um, yeah, now I'm just looking through, looking for these guys. It, it works the other way too. Um, I've always like every time, every time I build and I'm getting a lot of Sabonis, I've always liked playing Sabonis. Um, I mentioned, I like playing both Jokic and Embiid. I'm always excited when I see those guys this season, whenever it's a, De uh, oh no, I know his name now. DeJounte Murray night. Uh, I'll, I'm always like, let's go. Like if you build and you're three X the field on DeJounte Murray, I'm like, let's do it. I'm in. Um, yeah, that's funny. I don't know if I ever like really thought about this that hard until, this question got asked today. Um, it'll be like that in baseball too, especially with the pitchers. Um, I'm trying to think about if if there's any of those guys. But yeah, Don said he's the most consistent DFS player this year. Yeah, he's, he's been good. He's been balling. So, um, All right, let's see. Clint said, uh, Jordan, why do you think so many player, people still think it's about players and not lineups? I don't know. I think that's kind of just the, I think that's where you intuitively go, right? I, I think like that's, that's, that's honestly how DFS is kind of marketed or how, I don't know. I don't even think the sites can do too much marketing in the same way they used to, but that's, that's kind of how this, this game was marketed to like beginner and more casual players is like, pick the guys, go pick the players that you think are going to do well uh, that night. And DFS has kind of strategically come so far since then that I think people realize that it's, it's less about that now um, in terms of just trying to kind of predict the, the, the best plays, I guess, but I don't know. Um, I think there's an interesting point here actually of the less, the less rational, a player is thinking about the game, the harder it is to predict what they're going to do. So answering a question of like, why do I think somebody playing the game in a way that's not optimal is doing it like that? I don't know how to answer that question, but I also think it's an interesting like ownership question, right? Uh, one, one thing I've talked a lot about here on stream before is that at the lower stakes, I think ownership actually can be a little bit harder to take advantage of because you know people are going to mess up, but you don't really know how they're going to do it. It's very hard to predict how an irrational field or a less skilled field is going to make their mistake with ownership, but you know that they're going to do it. Um, like, which is why I think actually at like the higher stakes, higher stakes single entry, ownership can be a little bit easier to exploit. It's a little bit easier to find what those chalky plays are going to be because you know who those plays are going to be, right? The the plays that are probably going to go a little bit over owned are going to be the best overall projected plays on the slate. At the lower stakes, it's kind of it's kind of a guessing game right? The, the field will struggle enough to figure out what the best plays are. If you don't really know where they're going to make mistakes. So similar, like, right, this question just kind of reminded me of it. Like, I don't know really why people think about DFS in this way, I guess, but above and beyond, that's kind of how it has maybe been marketed historically. Um, but I don't know. So John says, how do you figure ownership for a 20 to 100 man contest? This is kind of like similar, I guess, to what I was just talking about. I think in general, you will see that ownership will condense on the best plays in those kinds of contests, right? 
smaller fields, people will take less risks. If coffee is 53% in a large field GPP, he might be 70% or 80% in those. Um, I know there was a week uh, last or maybe two weeks ago now when Booker and Paul were both out that like Cameron Payne had a couple slates where he was like 95% owned in small hundred man contests, right? You could, you could see the writing on the wall there. Cause he was projected for like 65% in the large field stuff. So I don't know. I don't know if I have like an easy process that I could give to you where I would say, this is how to project ownership for these contests. But I would say it's very safe to assume that ownership will condense onto the best overall plays for these kinds of contests. Um, so, yeah. Oh, <laughs> great Philip Rest has said Sonny Gray all the time. Sonny Gray is responsible for my biggest MLB win of all time. So I can't follow you there, uh, un unfortunately. Sonny Gray uh, threw like eight, eight uh, a no hitter, through, no hitter through eight innings. Or something like that. I can't even remember who he was playing uh, two or three years ago, and was responsible for my my best baseball win of all time. So I am I am firmly a Sunny Gray fan. Um, oh, you know what it is for baseball for me? It's it's freaking Brewer stacks, and particularly Christian Yelich. I don't think Christian Yelich has ever had a good game when I was over the field on him ever. I I Brewer stacks kill me. Um, and on the pitching side, the name that just popped into my head now I'm thinking about it a little bit more is Garrett Cole. I don't feel like Garrett I don't feel like Garrett Cole ever pays off for me. But again, I this is this is all fun to talk about. Um I think there's like everybody has those guys that they like to see them over the field on and under the field on. Um I but I really I would recommend trying to limit the way that this affects you as best as possible because ultimately a player feeling like they never succeed when you roster that guy is not a good reason to like make a crazy stand on a player that's just an objectively good play. And if you want to, if you do want to make some adjustments, do that in step three, where you are not adjusting the inputs to the system, right? Like I would say crossing Brewer stacks off in step three, when there are thousands of profitable lineups you could play without Brewer stacks is great. Going into step one and just cut, cutting those guys out or lowering the projections may is a little riskier. So Uh, Brad said, uh, random, don't know if Shady's here, but I haven't seen him in my contest lately. Did he have to move up? <laughs> he did. He tweeted about it. Uh, yeah, Shady is, uh, is, is no longer allowed in the under $3 contests. So, uh, uh, a bittersweet congratulations to, to Shady advice. The move up in stakes definitely comes with a, a increase in your competition, but I'm sure he will continue to crush it up there. So leaves the the lower stakes a little a little softer for us down here but John says do the sliders get factored in with the 20 man and 100 man competitions yeah we have we have a slider set that is set for I think they're not I mean normally single entries but there's a like a 11 to 100 man slider setting it's it's going to be you're going to be playing a lot of variations of a cash lineup in that particular contest in a contest like this you're your optimal strategy really is to assume that you have the best model, right? The best overall projections, build a lineup that is that factors in correlation, right? And then otherwise just allow a little bit of natural variance in there to, to diversify a bit. But like your edge in this contest is often going to be from having the best overall projections. Small field GPPs like this, I think like play a little bit more that way as opposed to the the game theory angle that you get in I don't know in in the larger field stuff but yes we a short answer we do have the we do have slider settings for those contests so Don said any college basketball coming yes probably next season though unfortunately um, we are working our, our our models team um, is working very hard on baseball right now to get ready for the start of baseball season so um, we will not. We will. We will not be able to support college basketball for for March Madness this year. But I'm hope, hoping for the start of next season. So, okay. And then James followed up in Slack and said that he is uh, knows how to reserve the lineup. So that's perfect. So yeah, that that James that should make a huge difference for you using the entry editor as opposed to King in those lineups. Um, 
because that that will that will save you so much time. So, all right, guys, I think we'll go ahead and leave it there. We're right at about the two hour mark. Uh, set another record here for the the longest office hour stream here today. We did one last week. We did another one today. So. That is amazing. That is what I'm here for to to answer everybody's questions and and also I guess just shoot the shit out of uh, or not out of uh, uh, about our uh, least favorite DFS plays in different sports, which was kind of a fun little tangent um, to to go on today. So I will be right back here again tomorrow, same time, same place, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, good luck in tonight's nine game NBA slate. Uh, Good luck. I think there's a one single hockey showdown tonight. So if you're grinding uh, the the hockey slates and playing the showdown tonight, good luck there. I imagine there's probably LPL for League of Legends. Um, if you're playing that, good luck. If you are still alive for the Players Championship, which has been the longest golf tournament of my life, good luck there. I think I've actually maybe got a little bit of a sweat there. So we'll see how that shakes out. We'll be right back here again tomorrow. So in the meantime, take care. See you.